Hi, Stephen. I just said hi. Hi, Elliot. Hey, Sam. I had this weird experience of getting on, seeing it was already recording without you there. It does it by itself? I don't know. You can turn it off. You can pause it. No, I can't. Oh, I'm lo I'm, I'm, I also can't because I'm not logged in as the administrator. Yeah, OK. I could, I could uh, leave and come back in as the administrator. Yeah, I don't think it matters. I mean, all this is going to be on the recording, but it's not a big deal, I guess. I'll be right back. Sam, did you send a, a source sheet for tonight? Yeah. All right, let me get that. I'm, I'm sure I have it in my email. Do you want me to send it to you again? Nope, I have it right here. Okay. Actually, you know what? If, if you haven't sent it in yet, I have a slightly updated version. It's just a few typos, but you want that? Sure, email it right over to me and then I'll put it up on my uh, Google Doc and share the link. Great. Yeah. I 
little arrow. I said, this time it's in Word rather than a PDF. Unmute. Yeah, for some reason uh, the PDF does not go in. Does, it's not compatible with Google Docs or something. I don't know. Okay. All right, I have it. Good. Okay, Ron. I give a couple minutes for Jewish time, or yeah, just give me two minutes. So I can get it up on the, the Google Drive and then we'll kick things off. So the last couple of weeks, this has been my first Zoom of the day. 12 days ago, I did five in a row oh my every God. hour from 11 till five. And then only because the Hartman Institute couldn't register me for two days after I applied, I missed seeing live uh, uh, Claire Sufrin and Yehuda Kurtzer. So I'll have to watch that tape, but that would have been my sixth of the day a week ago Tuesday. Yeah. But today, all morning, I was with Kova Torah, what was going to have been an in-person and became a virtual conference on Torah and climate, which was excellent. Oh, great. That's good to hear. I spent four hours on Zoom with the Partners for Progressive Israel this morning. Uh-huh. I, I don't think I know how to do, uh, where they are, what they're doing, huh? It was a, it was a board meeting, wasn't oh, it? Oh, I see. It was. It was. You may, you know, Tanakh is on this week, the whole week. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's um, all week but, long. And if you're in the diaspora, you, the uh, calendar is completely flexible. You can log in any time you want. You may, you Tanakh, organized by whom? Herzog College. Uh-huh. I think we're going to get started. I just posted up the source sheet for tonight in the chat. Uh, you can click on that link and it will take you to the source sheet where you can view it or print it, download it, etc. Um, and tonight is our third of four of our mini seminar with, with our good friend Sam Fleischacker on idolatry. Tonight we're going to jump to a contemporary thinker, Yeshua Leibowitz, and I turn that the, uh, the, the stage over to you, Sam. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, I think we have the righteous remnant here. Um, you know, the classes tend to get uh, lower attendance over time, but you know. We'll, we'll be in right. double digits again. Okay, we are in double digits, double just digits. barely, including me. Anyway, I'm going to um, start by putting the, uh, the uh, handout also up. And I want to go through it. Um, um, it's very rich. And there are a number of things I want to say just to explicate what Leibovitz is about. Um, and then I'll make a few summary comments. But I think what I have to say about him will come out in going through the source sheet pretty well. Just as a reminder, Yeshiyahu Leibovitz, um, was actually uh, a PhD in chemistry. He was also a doctor. I didn't realize that. He had an MD as well. Uh, born in Riga, educated in Germany, came to Palestine, I think it's the 30s, may have been the 40s, uh, became quite a prominent figure. He comes from an, uh, was born into a religious Zionist family, uh, observant Jew all his life, and he and very very knowledgeable on his own. He also did study philosophy, which is actually sort of clear in the co comments he makes about philosophy. As a professional philosopher myself, I often get annoyed when people who don't know philosophy talk about it, but he usually gets it right, and um, and that's I think a, a tribute to his wide knowledge. And he became best known for. Um, criticisms that he made of Israeli policy, often in very sharp terms. He's a kind of prophetic figure. I heard him once, he's an incredibly powerful speaker. Um, and uh, he was critical particularly, as we'll see, of the idea that uh, either the state of Israel or the land of Israel could be regarded as holy. Um, that's not just a political point by any means, it's integrated with his, his theology. And um, I want to emphasize his theology here, although we'll get to uh, his political uh, 
views as we go along. Let me ask everybody to mute and be if they're not talking because there's background noise otherwise that can make it hard to follow. Okay, so. Should, should we say a moment about his sister? Uh, I'm just gonna mention that his sister is Nechama Leibovitz who is uh, of course famous for her partial commentary. Um, but I'm not going to, I, I, I'm not gonna say anything more about her at this point. Um, I, I, I guess I will also mention that Yeshayahu Leibovitz in addition to his writings and his work as an academic and his political um, interventions, uh, ran study groups at his home and he was extremely open and people could come in and argue with him and he was apparently really a very friendly and welcoming person including to people who had very, very different views from him. Uh, his. It could be kind of harsh in manner but, um, but generous in spirit in a lot of ways. All right, so the main lines of his theological views, which I certainly want, I want to explicate. I don't mean, it mean to say I entirely share them. In some ways they're very problematic, but I also, I do want to try to make as much sense of them as I can. And, and if you want a figure in Jewish thought today or in the past who is, takes the attack on idolatry as central to what Judaism is, you can hardly find a better figure than Leibovitz. Uh, to, the only rival to that really is the Rambam, and Leibovitz takes himself, I think a little problematically, to be a follower of the Rambam. We'll get to that in due course. Uh, but at the heart of what Leibovitz has to say is that Judaism is centrally about not worshiping anything except God. And God is radically different from the world that God has created from any of his creations. And if you worship anything else, you treat anything else as an absolute good, you are an idolater. Um, and in particular, that led him quite often to sound, I think he would say he was, quite anti-humanistic. And any notion of a humanistic ethic, a new humanistic morality, he thought smacked of idolatry or could lead us to a, a, a idolatry. And that uh, becomes clear well, in many of these quotations here, but let's just start at the beginning. If the mitzvot are in the service of God, not of man, and for him, I'll just say briefly, this is the central thing of all his thought, the core of Judaism is doing the mitzvot. Um, and that is what it is to worship God. It's entirely in taking on the yoke of the mitzvot. Um, and, and this is the other point, they must be done for their own sake and not for anything else. And anybody who hopes to get anything out of them, not just, hopes to improve their business or treats them superstitiously, but and who sees any advantage to them, any value to them other than the service of God is again an idolater. If the mitzvot are in the service of God, not of man, they may not be directed toward the satisfaction of human wants. Any attempt to ground them in human needs, cognitive, moral, social, and national, deprives them of their religious meaning. If the commandments were expressions of philosophic cognition, had a moral function, or were directed at the social order, the conservation of the people of Israel, the observant Jew would be do, do, doing service, that is worshiping, to himself, to society, or to the nation. If you think this is good for the Jewish people, and that's why I keep halacha, then you're an idolater of the Jewish people. If you think it's good for me, either morally or in terms of my personal well-being, then you're an idolater of yourself. Instead of serving God, he would be utilizing God's Torah for his own benefit as an instrument for satisfying his needs. Then even more explicitly, just a few paragraphs later in the same essay, which really this religious practice catches everything in his theology extremely well. He says, ethics, when uh, regarded as unconditionally asserting its own validity, is an atheistic category par excellence. So notice that I have bolded one phrase here. That's not his bolding. I put that in because I want to stress it. You can quickly read the sentence as if he's saying ethics is atheistic. But, and, and he's rejecting it because it's atheistic. But if you look at the qualifying clause, he's saying ethics, when regarded as unconditionally asserting its own validity, if you take ethics as an end in itself, as a good thing in itself and not for the sake of God, then you're an atheist. Uh, a person who is ethical in this sense regards man, humanity, as the pre supreme end and value. Again, this anti-humanism comes out. That is, he deifies man. 
A person who perceives man as one among God's creatures and keeps in mind the verse, I have set God before me, cannot accept ethics as the overriding norm or criterion. Again, I want to stress, he's not rejecting ethics. He's just saying that you have to have ethics, take your ethics with the verse in mind, I have set God before me. Right? Your ethics has to be part of your service of God and not for the sake of humanity in itself. Being moral from the standpoint of a secular ethic can have only one, either of two meanings, directing man's will in accordance with man's knowledge of reality, the ethics of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and especially the Stoics. That's a slightly obscure sentence, but it's not a bad summary of one way of understanding ancient ethics that all ancient Greek ethical systems are trying to get your will to be in accordance with natural law, the way the nature, the way the order of nature works, so that you sort of figure out how nature works and then you come into accordance with it. That's explicitly what the Stoics are after. It's a slightly more tendentious reading of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, but it's not a bad reading. Or directing man's will in accordance with man's recognition of his duty, the ethics of Kant. So the what alternatives here are Ethics comes from knowing what nature is like, kochma, wisdom, sophia, or from recognizing your own duty, your, which stems from your will, which is a more modern and uh, especially a Kantian notion of ethics. Among the passages of the Shema, we find the words that you seek not after your own hearts and your own eyes. This comes uh, from the, part, the section on tzitzit, of course, which we have talked about before. After your own hearts, which the Rambam read following the Talmud as minut, he says, is the negation of Kantian ethics. If you go after your own heart, he takes that to be going after your own will. After your own eyes, what are eyes? It's a way of knowing, of seeing, is the negation of Socrates. The admonition, ani Hashem elokechem, I am the Lord your God, follows shortly thereafter. Which is to say, directly in the Shema, according to Leibovitz, we see explicitly that if you go after an ethics which is either in accordance with your knowledge, your eyes of the natural order, or your hearts, your will, then you're not following God. Instead, God says explicitly, and that means that any ethical system you had has to be subordinated to God, which is to say also for him, obviously, the mitzvot. Okay, again, playing this out a little bit more, but in, in slightly more shocking fashion in a way. Here it's against the love ethic. The Torah does not recognize moral imperatives stemming from knowledge of natural reality or from awareness of man's duty to his fellow man. Okay, so he's rejecting duty to fellow man, but this is again the same thing. He's rejecting a sort of uh, ancient ethics, knowledge of natural reality, and a modern one, duty to fellow man. All it recognizes are mitzvot, divine imperatives. The Torah and the prophets never appeal to the human conscience, which harbors idolatrous tendencies. So uh, he's rejecting conscience as an ultimate guide again, because you might not be serving conscience, you might be serving yourself or some other ideal or some humanistic version. And then he says, the God in one's heart, which humanist moralists sometimes invoke, is a strange God. I think, I'm pretty sure actually, that he is alluding to the same verse we used in the first class for the idea that idolatry is anger. Remember that the uh, Gemara in saying that idolatry is anger, quoted from, it's actually the Thursday Psalm, the one that we say every Thursday, Lo elzar, there shall not be, well, the way you would normally think this is, among you, right, among the Jews, elzar, but literally, lo there shall not be inside you a strange God. But the Talmud said, well, what is the elzar within you? It's anger. And Leibovitz says, what is the elzar within you? It's your conscience. It's really quite stunningly, I mean, I think he liked to be a bit of a, provoc a provocateur. Uh, it's not an, you know, not an impossible reading by any means. And certainly people justify all kinds of things in the name of their conscience, dishonestly, self-deludingly, and in many cases, certainly justify being an atheist, leaving the Jewish tradition or following any of a number of kinds of cult or fanatic uh, uh, political movements. 
He says, the idea that you can find your guide within you, in your heart, that in itself is turning to an Ilza. Okay, now the next little bit of this is the part that I described as a bit shocking. You shall love the neighbor as yourself. It's a great rule in the Torah, not because it is a precept transcending the formalism of law. I'll get back to this in a minute. Um, um, he has various kinds of polemics going on at the same time. On the one hand, he likes to tell uh, pious, moralistic, modern Orthodox Jews, you think halacha is about being moral? That's idolatry, has nothing to do with that. You just have to take on the yoke. On the other hand, he likes to tell reformed Jews, you think being Jewish about, is about love and caring for people and duty and doing justice? No, it's about mitzvot. And here, responding both to reformed Jews and to a lot of modern philosophers and to Christians, he says, the, uh, the, you shall love the law, uh, your neighbor as yourself. The reason it's a great rule is because it's one of the mitzvot. Not because it transcends the formalism of law and it's above the mitzvot, but precisely because it appears as one of the 613 mitzvot. It's not beyond law. It's not something to point to as Jesus does, for instance, to say, you don't need to worry about the law. You really have to worry about love. Nope, it's one of the laws. As a guide rule, you shall love the, uh, your neighbor as yourself is not specific to Judaism. And that's of course quite true. Similar precepts were set down in writing by the wise men of China, India, and Greece. In fact, it's been argued uh, fairly convincingly, I think, that you can find some version of something like you shall love the neighbors yourself or you shall not do to others as you wouldn't have done unto you in almost every tradition we know, certainly every long-standing one. And certainly there are versions of it in ancient Confucian thought, ancient Buddhist thought, etc. Moreover, and here's his punchline, you shall love your neighbor as yourself does not as such occur in the Torah. You thought that we have a verse saying, kamocha, right? Nope, that's not the verse. It's kamocha ani Hashem. The reading is, you shall love the na your neighbor as yourself, I am God. Which is to say, he's a punk, like his sister, I guess I'm mentioning her again, he's a punctilious reader of the Torah, and he says, you look at the verse, it doesn't say you should love the neighbor as yourself, you should love the, your neighbor as yourself, as part of your service to God. And of course, that's from a chapter, Leviticus 19, in the middle of Kadoshim, which is um, punctuated throughout by Ani Hashem, Ani Hashem, all the way through. And it's not unreasonable to say that there is a kind of emphasis that all the laws here are, you're being reminded, they're not just good ideas, <laughs> they're God's law. Okay, now to another aspect of his critique, this one directed um, I think specifically against reform critics and then other kinds of uh, maybe mystical critics or something of, uh, of halachic Judaism who say law that's cold and it's dry and, uh, and you can do it mechanically like a robot. Uh, and that's what he means when he says many oppose halachic Judaism for religious reasons as a commandment of men learned by rote. And he wants to say that is a real misunderstanding, or at least that um, this is the deepest kind of worship of God and any kind of more mystical, more feeling-based, more sentimental, more philosophical worship of God actually winds up being idolatry. God desires the devotion of one's heart, they say, and intention is more significant than anything else. And now you get this Rather mean, but I think not a base remark. How great was the religious feeling and how deep was the religious feeling and how deep was the religious experience? That's another thing that's emphasized a lot in modern thought of idolaters who sacrificed their sons to Moloch and abandoned their daughters to the whoredom of the worship of Ashtarot. The Torah invalidates such free, spontaneous, and natural religiosity with its implication of idolatry, incest, and bloodshed. It imprisons them. It imprisons spontaneous and natural religiosity within the confines of the mitzvot. Here, I think he makes a powerful critique that many of us as halachic Jews can recognize and has no qualms about the danger of becoming an artificial system accepted as a commandment of men learned by rote. The point is, 
that by observing mitzvot, we strike down the worship of our own religious feeling and experience and sense of ourselves, which can easily lead us into uh -huh. evil lead us to good. Um, again, I'm going to ask that people mute themselves before, uh, if they're not speaking, sure. the sound there. Um, and again, and I think this backs up the claim or elaborates the claim earlier about not worshiping the concept, uh, your conscience, the ails are within you, right? Because that can lead you astray, can lead you to follow Moloch, or the equivalent in the modern day. Okay, now. Basically, yes. what Leibovitz is saying is that, and uh, this is the way he's always characterized, what we need to do is, in order to worship God, is to make the choice to bow our heads yes. to the of God. And only doing that will enable us to, uh, only doing that expresses a commitment to God alone, as opposed to ourselves or to other kinds of values, uh, 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 only doing that prioritizes God above um, <laughs> other things. And if we pri prioritize anything else, then we are actually idolaters. Now, to, and, and he thinks if you look for a reason, if you look for something that the mitzvot do for you, do for you or for us or for the world, in that case, whatever it is you think that mitzvot halakha do, that will be your idol. That will be what you're really worshiping instead of God. Now, that doesn't sound exactly like the Rambam. Can't hear it. Um, Elliot, if I could ask you to mute people who are not no, muted. No, no. This, uh, these are the speakers. Um, Elliot? No. If you don't mind? Wait a minute. Could you mute, mute everyone? Okay, uh, no, still, we're still having a bit of an issue. Oh, it's on mute. Wait a minute. That's not gonna matter. Yeah. Means I know, that pressure. means you, yeah, you're right. Okay, so now wait a second. We want... Sue, Sue, could you press mute down below at the left? Ah, thank you. Okay. No, that's not gonna... Huh. All right. Um, That's ridiculous. What I could do is do phone with this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the Rambam also thinks that you need ultimately, of course he thinks, that you need ultimately to submit to the law, but it is not, the, the law for the Rambam, at least the way we normally understand him, and I think we saw this last time, is a preparation for understanding the universe as a rational place, for understanding that God is rational, and to understand that by way of our reason, we can't know God because no one can know God, but we can come closer and closer to knowing God. We can strip ourselves of idolatry. That is to say, there is a kind of rational ideal, rational understanding of God, which the Rambam is trying to lead us to. And he's also trying to help us be virtuous. He thinks that, the, I mean, help, he, he personally isn't doing this. He thinks that what halacha does is enable us to have a peaceful society, to develop virtues, and to contemplate God. That's not the same as saying you should obey the commandments just in order to obey the commandments. Leibovitz at least sounds like, I think is trying to say the second thing. The only way you show your complete submission to a God beyond you is to obey the mitzvot without expecting them to serve any other purpose. Nevertheless, Leibovitz wants to show that he's actually a follower of the Ramba. And so here is a passage and a juxtaposition that I wanted to emphasize that I think is quite interesting. Uh, and this came up last week when I think Jonathan was suggesting that there's a kinship between Leibovitz and the Ramba. And I was saying yes, but no, and yes and no, that there's a way in which it's true and a way in which he's different. So here's Leibovitz. Living in accordance with halakha, is this the ultimate end of the religious life? says Leibovitz himself. The answer is both yes and no. 
On the one hand, there can be no doubt that the end and perfection of religiosity, which the prophet calls knowledge of God and the psalmist nearness of God, are not a matter of conduct. Accordingly, Maimonides identifies the mitzvot of the Torah as it would seem, not with the ultimate perfection, but with the preparatory perfections. And so far, I think he's exactly right about Maimonides. In this sense, halachic practice is not the end of religion, but only a means and method. I think that's right for the Rambam. It's a means to a variety of higher goals. A very important means. You can't get rid of it, but it is a means to these higher goals. But now, Leibovitz quotes the Rambam to make him sound like himself. And I think it's a bit of a misquote, or at least the context is missing, but it does seem persuasive. But with a penetrating dialectic, Maimonides converts the instrumental status of the mitzvot into the end of religion. And now he's quoting from chapter 51 of the guide, which is perhaps the most beautiful chapter in it, and sums up Maimonides' account, the Rambam's account of the purposes of the law. What he quotes is this, know that all the practices of worship have only the end of training you to occupy yourself with his commandments rather than with matters pertaining to this world, as if you were occupied with him and not with that which is other than he. After nine chapters, Sosleibowitz devoted to clarifying the rationale of the particular precepts in terms of their utility for, per for perfecting the condition of individuals and of society. That's what I've stressed so far. Maimonides reveals the secret. The purpose of the mitzvot is to educate man to recognize that knowing God and cleaving to him consists in the practice of these very precepts, and this constitutes the worship of God. That is, he, he emphasizes just this. Know that all the worships of, uh, practices of worship have only the end of training you to occupy with his commandments. So Leibovitz says, what's he saying? You keep the commandments in order to keep the commandments. But here's the Ramban himself. That line does appear there. He's not misquoting it. It's right here, right? But the paragraph before, the Rambam says, We've already made it clear to you that that intellect which overflowed from him to, toward us is the bond between us and him. You have the choice. If you wish to strengthen, to fortify this bond, you can do it. If, however, you wish gradually to make it weak and feeble until you cut it, you can also do that. So first of all, clearly what the Rambam is saying, you have the choice between coming closer to God and not coming closer to God. So there seems to be a purpose here beyond each mitzvah in itself. You can only strengthen this bond by employing it in loving him and progressing toward this and is made weak and feeble if you busy your thought with what is other than he. Now comes the line that Leibovitz quoted, know that all the practice of worship have only the train, end of training you to occupy yourself with his commandments rather than with matters pertaining to this world, as if you were occupied with him and not with that which is other than he. And then immediately afterwards what he says, Rambam says, if however you pray merely by moving your lips and at the same time think about your buying and selling, or if you read the Torah with your tongue while your heart is set upon the building of your home and, doesn't, and you don't consider what you read, you should not think that you've achieved the end. That's the thing. What's the Rambam's point, not Leibovitz's point? When you perform mitzvot, use them to detach yourself from thinking about business, about your house, about your family, frankly, about anything other than God. In fact, the Rambam goes on to say, you should be a person, he contrasts davening while you think about business to thinking about God when you're doing business. You should be a person who whenever you're doing anything else, taking care of your kids, uh, you're having a, night, a date with your wife, doesn't talk about that, but you can throw this in. You're, you're having a business deal. You're not really thinking about it. You're thinking about God. Now, that is a radical kind of almost mystical, wholehearted commitment to God that I don't think many of us achieve, and many of us might think it's not even all that appealing, but it's clear that for the Rambam, you're not practicing the commandments just to practice the commandments. You're practicing the commandments to build an inner discipline that makes you intellectually and emotionally closer to God. And Leibovitz does not say that. He says you're practicing the commandments to keep the commandments. So I think there is a difference here, even though he correctly quotes the Rambam and he's quite clever about it. Anyway, we have now a view, and I'm gonna move briefly to his politics. According can, to- Can we discuss that before the politics or? Um, I'm afraid that we won't get to it otherwise. So just hold your question for a minute. 
I, I'll go rather quickly over the kind of politics. I, um, some people may want to d dwell on this more, on the politics more, but I, I'll try to do it fairly quickly, just to make sure that we get it under our belt. Because Leibovitz was, after all, particularly well known for his critique of Israel and of a certain kind of Zionism. And I might stress again, he was himself a Zionist. Um, and it's very important, I think, to see how these things are integrated. Um, so on the one hand, I think he's almost too well known for treating Israel as a Bush uh, object of idolatry, both the state and the land. On the other hand, um, that critique is often taken out of context, and I want to put it into the context. So we've seen all over here that uh, 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 this first line here, only a religious requirement sanctioned by halakha is sacred. Sacredness, holiness for him must go with mitzvot, with carrying out commandments. So obviously, for the, in that case, fatherland, security even, nation, liberty, honor, loyalty, beauty, conjugal love, parental love, if not defined and imposed by religious precept, if not integrated into mitzvot, may not be sanctified or represented as absolute values. It could be a value, but not an absolute value in the name of which anything may be done and for the sake of which everything must be done. That is idolatry for him. And actually, I quite agree with that definition. And next week, when I come to my own views of idolatry, I'm going to sort of jump up from that kind of line. By distinguishing the sacred from the profane, halakha functions as a bulwark against idolatry in all its manifestations and a defense against the corruption with it. For idolatry, and this is a beautiful definition here, which I like a lot, for idolatry is simply the representation of things profane, chol, as sacred, as possessing supreme and absolute worth. Doesn't mean that they're worthless. It, it's good to eat. It's good to have a, a happy marriage. It's good to raise your kids. But they do not have absolute worth. The only thing that has absolute worth, he says, is mitzvah. Consider the nature of the sanctity of national security or the sanctity of military loyalty and discipline in the wake of, wake of which we have Kafir Qasim, which was a massacre in, back in the 50s of Arab villages. Uh, so he thinks treating the state as sacred or treating security as sacred itself is a source of the corruption of the Israeli military. There's a corruption of Israeli politics and the corruption of the Israeli military. Um, further down, same point here, whoever ascribes holiness in actu, that is not potentially, but in actuality to man, to a nation again, to an object or to a country again, elevates that thing to divine rank, though God alone is high, high, holy. Such a person is stumbled into idolatry. And uh, now talking about the supposed holiness of the Jewish people, the singularity of the Jewish people consists in the Torah without, uh, with, with that was given to the people and the service imposed upon it, the mitzvot again. Without these, the Jews are like all other peoples. The sanctity of the land of Israel too refers to the service of God, namely to the mitzvot which obtain only in the land of Israel. So it is called Eretz HaKodesh. It's a holy land. He doesn't want to deny that, but his understanding of that is, why is it holy? because you can perform certain mitzvot in it. There are certain mitzvot that are unique to the land of Israel that we can't perform anywhere else. Shemitah, Yobel, of course, certain kinds of uh, ties that we have to take and so forth. Um, that's what makes it holy, nothing else does. The country has no intrinsic holiness and the mitzvot do not derive from its holiness. Now, it's clear that this fits very well with his general view. Nothing can be holy except God. Faith in the holy God ought to prevent man from ascribing intrinsic holiness to anything in the world. It ascribes holiness in the world only to the service of God. So to God in the first instance, and the second instance to the mitzvot. And this will now be the last text I want to bring. I, I, you know, I hope it's clear, as I indicated, that his political critique is an integral part of his religious view generally. It's just that he diagnoses a lot that he thinks goes wrong with um, both the state of Israel and particularly with religious Zionism, remember which he belonged to as a religious Jew who's also a Zionist and raised in a religious Zionist home. I think he thinks a lot that goes wrong is a mistaken conception of holiness and a replacement of the holiness of the mitzvot with a holiness of land or of statehood, all of which he thinks are just uh, conveniences. The state serves a pragmatic purpose, not a religious one. So in 1988, he was asked to give a five minute Devar Torah for Israel Army Radio. I do think things have changed a lot 
I, it's hard to imagine anybody like um, Yeshayahu Leibovitz being asked to speak on Israeli um, uh, army radio on anything, let alone give a regular drasha. Uh, his drasha on uh, the Zota Bracha, on the very last uh, section of the Torah, comments on the very last Rashi in the Torah, which talks about Moses being described as having all these mighty deeds and terrible acts. And Rashi says, what are the mighty deeds and terrible acts? It's the breaking of the tablets, and, uh, which is a very surprising thing to say. So Leibovitz stresses, stresses first that this is a really weird thing to say. That's the greatest deed that Moses accomplished was not the deliverance from Egypt, nor transmitting the Torah, but that he broke the tablets that had been engraved by God when the people worshiped idolatry. And then he uses it to make a very interesting point. So first of all, we get his usual view, to break idolatry, not to sanctify values which stem from human drives and faith, that is faith. So the primary job we have as Jews is not so much to do something positive as to do something negative, to break idolatry, not to, to worship anything other than God. The main thing in faith in God is not to believe in anything which is not divine, not to sanctify things which stem from the drive, interests, plans, and ideals and visions of man, even if in human terms they're the most lofty of matters. When these things are made into something holy, they are to be smashed. And that was the greatness of Moses, he says, to whom were given the tablets engraved by God and which he smashed to show that no object is holy. If those to whom the object is designed do not have the intention of worshiping God, but their own gods, the sanctity may even turn into a stumbling block. So let me just pause for a second before we get to the last point, which is how he brings it into politics. The reading he's giving us, as I understand it, is that what's great about Moses breaking the tablet is that because the people are worshiping the golden calf, if you now give them the tablets, they're going to think the tablets are just like the golden calf. They're going to mix them together. Because they're in an idolatrous state of mind, they cannot even hold on to something holy. Okay, so you cannot even have the word of God if you're going to treat it as next to things that are not holy, like the golden calf. And that he uses to make the following, in my opinion, quite stunning political point, especially on Israel radio. We are today witness to a terrifying phenomenon, this is 1988, that those who are considered to be in charge of dealing with the Torah and have seen to the observance of the Torah use in their statements such formulations such as, this is actually still quite common, the sanctity of God, the holiness of God, the holiness of the Jewish people, and the holiness of the land. In the same breath, in a trinity of holiness, that's of course meant to be very insulting. These are the same tablets which were given to the people who said of the calf, these are your gods of Israel. The holiness of God alone, that is the content of faith. If one adds to it the holiness of the people, the nation, and the holiness of the land, in one breath, in the same context, the holiness turns into its opposite. If you talk about the holiness of God and you add to that the holiness of the people of Israel, or the state of Israel, or the land of Israel, you have just desecrated the holiness of God according to. So there's a very stark view that we are a people committed and committed solely to recognizing that God is the only being who is worthy of worship. And that any kind of setting up of anything else as an absolute value is idolatry. And if we violate that, and we live that out by way of performing mitzvot, and if we violate this commitment, either by not performing mitzvot or more seriously, by setting something else up next to God as holy, we turn into the idolaters we're meant to, fight, uh, to struggle against. Okay, uh, I know that there are questions, among others, from, um, from Jonathan. Um, I'm now open to questions. This is more of a comment critique of him, not of you. And a question, I could do it for 40 minutes, I'll try to do it in one or two. I am totally, 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 totally opposed to the abominable theology that you are accurately and thoughtfully conveying to us. I called it and Bleich along similar lines a couple of weeks ago, just shut up and do it. It occurs to me as you're making this wonderful presentation that he is an idolater of orthopraxy, that he wants to sap the great rich 
Torah tradition of all of its meaning and content and feeling and, 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 and purpose and spirit, just to say it's, it's mechanistic, just do what it says there. First of all, you can't do what it says there. You can't do it without values and ideas behind it. Uh, a boy whom I associate with this terrible idea had a debate in Shema in the 70s with T. Blanchard. Is there a metahalachic value system or is it just all written down there in the book? It isn't even written down there in a book. You can't do just the do. There's got to be a feel and attitude and Tamei Amitzvot behind it. That, that's what Avraham, God says to Avraham, I'm giving you this to convey to your, your, your children and, 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 and house after you so that you shall do righteousness and justice. Right. That's, you can't put that into technical legal terms. The prophets are not about technical legal terms. And it, I believe, and, and my Rebbe's, whom I'll list quickly in a minute, believe Jonathan, that, that you've got to, you can't take too long. Don't list all the Rebbe's. Just make, bring okay, it to right, close to the other people. My modern Orthodox, socially, emotionally liberal and religious Zionist teachers from Rav Soloveitchik to many others, believe that the purpose of the Torah is Lutzarev Tabriot. We are trying to perfect our ideas, our thinking, our feeling, our attitude, so that we can make halachic decisions ourselves effectively because we get ourselves a Ruach Torah. And he is trying to steal all of that from us. Well, look, I don't totally disagree. Um, I think Leibovitz is better as a critic than as a positive theologian. Although I do think he worked out his theology more powerfully. It's, it's harder to argue against him than it seems. I noticed that Josh Shane's put in the chat that he doesn't seem so out of context. I agree. I kept looking at that line. He is, he's, he's not distorting the line. He doesn't leave something out. Uh, Rambam does say, know that the purpose of keeping the mitzvot is to keep the mitzvot, but he says to keep the mitzvot so as to strip yourself of your attachment to things in the rest of the world and to come closer to God. And I still think that there is more of a sense of an internal discipline that this contributes to than you get in Leibovitz. But it's, it's an arguable point. He actually reads the sources quite well. Moreover, he does have a positive view. It's just a positive view that comes out through negatives. The whole point of keeping the mitzvot, there is a point, is to not worship anything other than God. And that does make some sense. The other, and I'll come back to that in one second, but one, the other thing I wanted to say, Jonathan, I, I know that you, uh, to a large extent from what we, our conversation in the past, you probably share this. Leibovitz wound up being ironically one of the strongest moral and humanistic voices to speak out against uh, moral wrongs that were done in Israel, including Kafir Qasim. Um, and it seems as if, a, a, against his own theology, as it were, he did have a kind of moral compass that he did not drive, derive simply from the Torah. He also was quite willing to argue with people in the religious Zionist world who said, oh, well, the land is holy and doesn't matter what we do, and would draw on verses or uh, you know, on like the first Rashi in the Chumash to try to prove that Jews can do whatever they want in order to secure their ownership over the land. And he would respond with the knowledge of verses, but also with a kind of a moral critique. So ironically, in a way, he didn't live up, and this may be a good thing, he didn't live up to his own anti-humanism. He didn't live up to his own anti-moralistic uh, way of understanding the mitzvah. Moreover, he also had eccentric readings of various mitzvot, and he must have used outside values to some extent to get to them. But just to get back to the, what we had in the middle uh, here, which I think it doesn't, it doesn't answer your criticisms, Jonathan, but it responds to them a bit. Um, when he says that many people oppose halakhic Judaism as a, as a commandment, learned by rote, as mechanistic. It is true that he comes around saying to say, it is an artificial system that is mechanistic, but before he does that, and, and that's very disappointing, to say it's just a mechanistic system, which doesn't seem to be the way he lived it himself, that's very disappointing. But before he does that, he gives you a critique of what the alternative looks like. You wanna say, well, I gotta rely on my religious feeling, my religious experience, that can very easily lead you 
to idolatry in a fairly evil sense. That's, that's, uh, that criticism, I think, rings true. We can all think of, of cults, in many of them in the, in the 20th century, and uh, forms of political fanaticism, including some of the kind of uh, hardline right-wing religious Zionists that he's criticizing, who take their own internal religious feeling and experience, as it were, to tell them what God really means. And he wants to say, mitzvot prevent you from that. And I think as a negative point, there's a lot to that. I don't know, the idea that then it all collapses into a mechanistic system is still worrisome. I uh, would argue that mechanistic observance uh, also uh, needs to have a guide. If you don't have the spiritual values behind it, you can go wrong just following the rules badly and, yeah. and selfishly and foolishly. Myra. Myself. Yeah. The, isn't the point not the ultimate? I think that he, what he's saying is that the ultimate goal is to serve God, meaning to draw yourself closer to God, which has that religious element in it, but it's the means that's different. That if you're doing the mitzvot because you decided this is correct because my moral sense is telling me that I should do it or because you feel you have to the olam because of something, that's idolatry. But if you're doing the mitzvot in a sincere attempt to follow God's will, which is going to elevate you in a Maimonidean sense and, and have you surpass the form and be a matter and become kind of form and and go up to god then that's that's what the mitzvot are trying to do that it's not a thing that's based on your judgment and you're doing it to prove that you're moral or that you're kind but you're doing it to serve god but the ultimate that happens to you is then you go up and you do have this religious experience because you're bringing yourself closer to God. So again, you, I, I agree with you entirely, Myra, about the negative part. If, if, if he certainly would say, if you think the reason you're keeping this is because this is tikkun olam or because it's making you moral, that's no good, that's idolatry, right? That's clear. But the positive part, if you do this, it'll give you a religious experience. He doesn't say that. It'll elevate you to God. He doesn't say that. He does say... And this well, you're a, serving God, though. So by serving God, yeah. you're, you're being connected to God. I mean, right. that's the outcome of it. It may not be, I'm doing this in order to be elevated. But by doing this, it's clear that that's the goal of it. So let's put it this way. And, I, and, and I'm, I'm putting this out as something of an open question because I don't know when to answer really. And I think a lot of people have wrestled with him about this. Uh, a good friend of mine in Israel, Danny Stuttman, who is a philosopher at Haifa, he used to hang out at Leibovitz's house and argue with him. That's part of how I know that he was open to that. And he has a nice article on how Leibovitz is much less close to the Rambam than he thinks he is, partly because he has stripped out a lot of what the Rambam thought was the purpose of the commandments. But here's the thing. You can say definitely for Leibovitz that by keeping the mitzvot, you are doing God's will. You are coming closer to, let's say coming closer to God. But you might then want to ask, what do you get out of coming closer to God? And if you ask that, if you think, oh, but this is going to be so great, this is your, the point of your life to come and sort of love God and be so close to God, he'd say, nah, that's idolatry. If you want to say you're just coming closer to God and all you're doing is expressing your willingness to submit to God, that's, he seems to think that's right. He was very influenced, by the way, by Kierkegaard, and there's something very existentialist about this. And I actually think Kierkegaard is richer than he has him, but the sort of mid 20th century view that what Kierkegaard is saying, it, many people think this is what Kierkegaard is saying, I'm not sure I agree, is that you just have to submit. He seems to think that. So if what your, the purpose of your life is to submit to God and you express that by keeping the mitzvot and you don't care if you get anything out of that, I assume in this life or the next, then you're the Leibovitzian Jew. 
but it's very easy to say, well, that seems empty. I don't get it. While for the Rambam, you do, as you said, elevate yourself, get higher. It's not selfish. It's not like, oh, that would be fun. I could do this or I could go to Disney World, you know, and this is nicer. It, it was supposed to be a great experience, the best possible human experience. But none of that's in legal things. Elliot. Oh, and then Robert. Sam, Sam, uh, I, I took two quick questions, one of which you started to address, which was a comment you made last week about really viewing Leibowitz more as an existentialist than, than as a rationalist, and, and maybe you could elaborate on that. And then my second question is picking up on what Myra was just saying, which is, is, is it possible that um, his view, I, I don't think there's anything in what you've shared with us or, or other of his writing that I've read, which precludes one from having um, spiritually enrichment, spiritual enrichment, joy, uh, satisfaction, feeling of good feelings of, 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 you know, the, the kind of, you know, religious experiential feelings as, as a derivative or as a byproduct of the duty. So where am I, or am I not reading that right? So I guess my question, the question is, is he, is he precluding that or is, do you think there is room you just have to be cautious and, and vigilant not to latch on to doing it in order to get the feeling. Well, he doesn't. You're, you are quite right that he doesn't rule out having such an experience. He never talks about it, as far as I know. Not in any of the writings that I know. I mean, he wrote a lot and maybe he did somewhere, but I think he would avoid it. Even if he thought he had some kind of powerful religious experience, he wouldn't tell you about that because the problem is, that you would then do it because that's what you want. And I do think, I mean, again, the negative part of his critique is powerful. People will say, I'm doing halacha because I want to have this great experience of God. There is something idolatrous about that. I, I'm with him on that. Um, it serves the self. It serves, it's putting yourself yeah. in front yeah. of the I mean, what you don't want to say is, well, you know, I used to enjoy keeping Shabbos, and so I was serious about it, and now it's no fun, so I'm going to stop. Right? You're supposed to keep it whether it's fun or not, right? And there has to be some kind of willingness to put up with costs. But, but Leibovitz makes it sound like any kind of sense that you might like get something out of this, any oneg, that that ruins it. And that does seem too extreme. Robert. I want to take the inverse of all of this. Yeah. We have the principle, at least some people, I mean, Ramban is a principle, that you can observe all the mitzvot and be Rosh Right. 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 So, and that would seem to go against what the Lewis is saying. Right? He's well, that, done it. And I was thinking, if all of us vote, you'd be a total Russia. Right, that's really interesting. You know, I'm sure there's some place in which he commented on that Ramban. Um, his work has not been collected all that much, and certainly it hasn't all been translated, at least as far as I know. Um, I think, Josh, you know about some other sources with a larger collection. I don't know if he ever commented on that, but it does seem as though, on his view, it would be hard to explain the Ramban, and he might go with the Rambam, that actually everything good that we need to do is actually contained within the Torah. Now, remember, the difference between the Rambam and the Ramban is a subtle one. They both think we have to be a decent human being. It's just that the Ramban thinks it is necessary that a certain general kind of decency, as well as Kedusha, has to transcend mitzvot, has to be beyond, no, no. it cannot be written down. While the Ramban thinks it can be. You can be commanded. And in that, if that's the debate, I think it's pretty clear that Leibovitz uh, sides with the Rambam rather than the Ramban. That uh, in, in, if, you, if, what, if what we mean is, keeping every letter of the halacha as received, either by trying to read it out of the Torah, which would be a mistake anyway, or the Gemara, or the codes, you've checked off everything on the list and you're still a jerk, that's certainly possible. However, if you understand that there are these larger commands that are somewhat open-ended, in the gesture that at least within the Torah itself, and it was certainly with many of the codes in which you're supposed to be a decent human being, and you're supposed to uphold justice in a general sense, then uh, it's not possible, logically possible, on this view, that you can be keeping Torah and still be a, a bad person. 
Um, the crucial thing then for Leibovitz, I'm pretty sure this would be his answer. I don't know whether it is, but I'm pretty sure it would be. Um, the crucial thing for Leibovitz is you're not being just, as because, just or, or decent or kind or generous because it's just a good thing to do that. You're doing it because it's a command. You're doing it because that's part of what God commands you to do. Josh. Yeah, first of all, thanks for that masterful presentation. Um, just one comment. It seems to me, this is the historian in me, I guess. For those of you who don't know, I'm, a, I'm sort of a, uh, what's the word? I don't know. Leibovitz is one of my primary influences, and I've, and I've published on him. Um, although you have to take him, you know, he's hard to take. Someone joked that if you read him for more than 10 minutes, it's hard because he just yells at you a lot. <laughs> so, it seems to me that everyone's got to be taken in their context. So, you know, it's not a surprise if you look at Sadia Gaon, he's obsessed with the Karaites because that's sort of the competition as he saw it that's perverting Judaism. So look at Leibowitz in his context, he's sitting in late 20th century Israel. And so the perversion to him is the elevation of land and nation to idols that people are willing to, set, to suppress Judaism, Torah, mitzvot, everything, for the, the idolatry of nationalism and the idolatry of the land. And so a lot of his theology, I think, you know, he does talk about Kabbalah being, a, you know, not real and he, it's a problem and, and so on. But he's, a, he's ruthless, both secular Zionism and religious Zionism. He himself was a Zionist, but a political Zionist in the sense that he wants right. Jews to have self-rule, but not as a religious value as a practical way of protecting themselves. Right. He describes absolutely no theological significance to the nation, no theological significance to the land. Uh, it's all about simply Jews having self-rule for practical protection. So I, I think the context that he's writing in has got to be part of what, you know, he, he's obsessed with that because that's all around him and he's trying to fight the biggest sin of his day from, from his perspective. I think that's right, but I would add, surprisingly enough, more bits of context. <laughs> um, so for instance, religious praxis, which is what most of my uh, handout comes from, is a 1950s essay. So there are all kinds of things that are going wrong in Israel even then, but they, uh, they have not conquered the West Bank. There's no settlement project. And some of the more uh, dire forms of right-wing Zionism haven't, don't come in, haven't come into existence yet. The other thing is, he's also carrying out a polemic against Reform Judaism and against, especially of the non-legal form of Reform Judaism. Yes, for sure, for sure. In a sense, people like Leo Beck have, and Jonathan's father, Arnold Wolf, had a sense of law as central to Judaism, though not in the sense that Leibovitz would, uh, would accept, but especially the kind of we're beyond the law thing. And more specifically, it's probably an anti-Buber polemic. Buber is around in the same town, and, uh, and any kind of notion that, oh, well, all, well, to be Jewish is really to have these mystical experiences and to read the, the, the Hasidic tales and get all moved, he's as much against that as anything, especially earlier in his career. So later on, it's more clearly, and it's maybe why so many secular Israelis came to love him, more clearly an attack on a kind of idolatry of the land and of the state. But earlier on, and I think to some extent this continues into the later work too, he also wants to say, this is a religion of law, guys, and law is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and mysticism and, and personal experience. That I, I, as Elliot said, I don't, mean, I don't think he means to say you shouldn't have that. You should try to not have any kind of personal experience when you keep Shabbos. He's not saying that. But if you think that's what it's for, or if you think that can replace the law, then you're an idolater. Right. So that I would add in those polemics. Yeah, I agree. Okay, well, I think we're almost out of time. I am going to, so yeah. Just, I apologize for interrupting. Yeah, no, please. Quickly, just elaborate just a little bit on your comment about him as an existentialist as, versus a rational. Oh, yeah, 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 thank you. Um, so I, I would love to pin this down more specifically. I, I find it kind of elusive, because, especially because he keeps talking about the Rambam. But let's put it this way. The Rambam is very much the, the figure who integrates Plato and Aristotle with halacha, right? So there's an ideal in Plato and Aristotle, some of the Stoics as well, of our reason being the image of God within us. We need to live up to our reason and we need to use our reason to come close to God. Now that's complicated a little bit in the Rambam's case because 
we can't ever really know God. But actually that fits with Plato too, as it happens. You, but you can know that you can't know God. And that itself, reaching that philosophical height, that is what religious experience is about. Which is to say, there is a reason for this whole system. The system is held together by an, a, a goal, an understandable, if complicated and abstract and difficult goal, which all of halakha prepares us for and then philosophy as it were completes. For Leibovitz, there's more of a sense of, shall we say, absurdism. Um, God is totally beyond us, same as the Rambam in that sense, but really beyond our reason as well. And, they, and we can't give you a reason why you ought to do this. I don't want to too much agree with Jonathan here, but you just ought to do it. The point is there's a God who is beyond you, who commands this of you, and you need to humble all of yourself, including your reasons, in order to serve God. That sounds more like existentialism than like the Rambam, even though he also tries to graft it onto the Rambam. Does that help? Sort of beyond reason. There's something, there's something much less rationalist about it. Leibovitz, even if he uses reason to explain a lot of his views and so forth. Do we have time for one more quick point, Sam? I'm not going anywhere, but others may be. Let's, uh, let's Okay, I just want to quickly <laughs> say, yeah. I, I would accuse Leibovitz of, of sanitizing and bleaching what's actually in the Chumash. I mean, there are Tami mitzvot. It says dozens of times, Ki Evid Haita Beret Mitzrayim. That's an explanation. There are values and attitudes of things like Tzedek Tzedek, which he tries to circ you know, circumvent, but th you are, there are meant to be underlying purposes and values and attitudes that the Torah inculcates. And it says so in the Chumash, and he just reads that away. Yeah, look, every interpretation of Judaism emphasizes some things and de-emphasizes others, right? Um, and that is true for the Rambam too, it's from the Ramban, and I, um, and I think you'll find it's true of my view, uh, the view I give too. Um, I don't know how he would handle those things. Um, he might say that some of those reasons are partial reasons for keeping the mitzvot, but that if you treat them as absolute values, that's what's truly idolatry. Or he might take the more radical, as it were, existentialist line and say, God says that, and that too you have to treat as absurd. You only should value your own life and your own happiness because God tells you to. Um, there is something extreme about his views. In a sense, extremely ascetic. It's not ascetic in the sense that he says you should do without food or do without drink or do without sex, but in the sense that you should do without thinking that your pleasures matter, that your joy matters, and that your human uh, conscience matters, or matters very much at least. It's just a, a lower level thing. And, and, and on the one level, that's powerfully humbling and it can be used as a, as a stick to beat arrogance with, which he did very effectively. On the other hand, it doesn't seem enough. And I, I, I agree, it doesn't seem enough to live for. Sam, Sam I, wanted to, I wanted to pick up on that and ask the question. In some of his writings, he talks about the distinction between um, uh, lishma versus non-lishma uh, uh, performance of mitzvot and, and contrasting you know, the, the, the first uh, Shema, the, the line from the paragraphs that follow. Uh, and, and, you know, he's not ignoring uh, the parts where he, where, where it's described as an instrumental uh, relationship, right? Do the mitzvot so that you get the rain in the proper season. He, he refers to that as non-lishma, but he acknowledges that it's there. He just says the ideal is, to, to do the mitzvot lishma, truly for its own sake, without these selfish considerations. So I, I, I don't know that he's completely wiping it away. I mean, he acknowledges that, that, those, that in that example, he acknowledges that text is there, but he, he's prioritizing the, the purest. Yeah, in those passages, he'll say, this is the less good way of doing it. Right. Look, he's following something that has strong, deep rabbinic roots. 
there's lo lishma shaba lishma, right? You do it lo lishma, that's what the kid does. You know, the kid keeps Shabbos because you give them a present or whatever, or you make it nice for them, and hopefully they'll eventually do it lishma. And the same for us on our, on our uh, even as adults. Yeah, maybe you're doing things lo lishma to start off with, but ultimately that's supposed to bring you to do it lishma, and then doing it lishma for him is this, fairly extreme kind of, I mean, I use the word ascetic commitment to God just for the sake of God alone. And he knows that that's hard work, but um, he thinks that in the end, that's what we're here for. And, you know, very few people, I have to say, fully accept that. At the same time, again, he makes a really great critic of many other views of what Judaism might be about. Well, thank you all very much. This was a wonderful discussion, wonderful talk, and come back next week and we'll hear Sam's synthesis and his own perspective on, on the topic. So do please come back next week, same channel, same place. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Yasha Koch, wonderful. Thanks to everybody and for all the organizing. Thank you. Really terrific.